Iran is still smuggling weapons to Judea and Samaria, and Hamas is still shooting rockets into southern Israel from the Gaza Strip, leaving us to wonder how all of this is possible. Meanwhile, the IDF is changing its combat tactics in Gaza. I'm Yair Pinto, and this is your Boots on the Ground report about what is happening in Israel and the 172 day of this war against Hamas and Hezbollah. The achievements of the IDF in Gaza City's Shifa Hospital are the result of a change in the fighting perimeters of the Southern Command in the Gaza Strip. In the first two months of the maneuver in the Gaza Strip, more than three divisions were activated in the north of the Gaza Strip. They were accompanied by powerful support from the Air Force in a complex offensive against a prepared and fortified enemy. This enemy was prepared for a rigged defense in the entire built-up area and deep under the ground. The fighting of the 98th Division in Khan Yunus was also initially characterized by a powerful multi-dimensional offensive battle. After two months of hard fighting, the IDF managed to dismantle the organized military structure of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. What remained were large numbers of small cells, sometimes just individuals, with vague orders to continue the battle against the IDF however they see fit. The IDF has been mopping up these pockets of terrorists wherever they found them ever since. The fairly sophisticated military system Hamas built starting shortly after it seized control in the Gaza Strip in 2006 was very different from the terrorist guerrilla force it had previously been. They obviously had help in this, mostly from Iran and Hezbollah. Together they built a powerful military force organized in battalions and brigades controlled by headquarters, supported by advanced communication systems and weapons, supported by an industrial production system for diverse means of warfare. However, now that the force has been shattered by the IDF, Hamas is reverting back to its former ways, becoming a more decentralized guerrilla force with the survivors of the IDF attacks organizing using improvised skills and jihad determination. Faced with this change in the structure and methods of Hamas's operation, the IDF Southern Command were required to, as the old say is going, adapt, improvise, and overcome. It is appropriate to explain the advantages of changing the IDF's mode of operation. The change in the deployment patterns of the Southern Command and the significant reduction in the scope of the forces are adopted in this aspect to the conditions of guerrilla warfare. These conditions include the prolonged deployment of military forces in an area that remains saturated with weapons. The second step in changing the pattern of operations was reflected last week in the quick and highly successful raid on Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. What appears on the face of it is the IDF's abandonment of the area in the center of Gaza City actually created the conditions for a quick and targeted raid under conditions of surprise. In other words, the IDF set a trap for Hamas and Hamas rocked right into it. The achievements in dismantling the Hamas military system in the first offensive campaign are of course what created the conditions for the transition of the new pattern of action. Please continue to help us spread the truth by clicking the follower button, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share our content with your friends. And don't forget to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Next, I need to tell you about some political developments. Usually, I don't really get into politics, staying in my military lane. But we have to understand the political picture clearly as it directly affects the military picture. We had a clear goal in this campaign to avoid a forced ceasefire without a hostage deal. 
there was an American proposal on the table for Hamas to release the remaining Israeli hostages they abducted on October 7th in exchange for a prolonged ceasefire. The terrorist organization Hamas replied to Qatar and Egypt that they were entrenched in their demands for a permanent ceasefire that would include an unconditional Israeli retreat and rejected the American proposal. Despite the huge list of demands that Hamas required and its rejection of all the efforts to compromise, the UN Security Council voted on Monday evening to demand an immediate ceasefire, handing Hamas almost everything it wanted on a silver platter. The US abstained on the vote, breaking with its previous policy of vetoing such resolutions. A senior Hamas official was terribly satisfied with the UN Security Council's decision, declaring that this step will isolate Israel, provided to put pressure on Netanyahu, according to his words. On the other hand, for many weeks, the international discussion surrounding the Gaza war has been focused on one central question. Will Israel invade Rafah? In my opinion, there is no way to avoid a ground entrance to Rafah, where according to intelligence estimates, about 1.4 million Gazans are concentrated at the moment. Among them are thousands of Hamas terrorists who are hiding in a small area of 64 square kilometers, among the masses of Palestinians who fled there in the shadow of the battles. However, in that tangled urban space, there were only about 250,000 Gazans until before the war. That means that the population has increased by 700% in the past few months. Let's talk about it. From the IDF's point of view, the IDF is preparing for a prolonged fighting in the Gaza Strip, which is expected to take a few weeks, including a military battle in Rafah. Israeli officials have stated that the IDF believes they can significantly damage Hamas's remaining capabilities in order to move to the next stage of the maneuver. Rafah is the last bastion of Hamas control and there are a number of battalions left that Israel needs to dismantle in order to achieve its military goals in this war. Rafah must be next in line because we must free the hostages and the IDF has morals and values. It does everything to prevent possible harm to uninvolved civilians. This is from a military point of view, but from a political point of view, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said that the Prime Minister approved the IDF's plan for Rafah operation after receiving Hamas's responses to the proposed deal for the release of the hostages. After Prime Minister Netanyahu and his office announced last night that Hamas's response shows that Hamas is still persisting in unreasonable demands as part of the negotiations for the release of the hostages, even today Netanyahu's office repeated these announcements that Hamas demands are still unfounded. To sum up, from what I understand right now, from all the reports around, the U.S. still supports Israel in the realization of all the goals we want to achieve in the Gaza Strip. However, it disagrees with us regarding the manner of realizing these goals in Rafah. The whole dispute between the U.S. and Israel is that the U.S. does not wish the IDF to enter Rafah for fear the harm that will be done to civilians Will be high. Additionally, for the scenario of the expansion of the war includes a spillover of refugees across the border between Gaza and Egypt. This would damage Washington's relationship with the Egyptians and possibly other Arab governments, including Saudi Arabia and more. But the important thing is that there is no disagreement with the American administration regarding the military operation in Rafah. The departments are concentrating on the care of the civilian welfare in Gaza at the same time as the pressure 
from the terrorist organization Hamas. Meanwhile, incredibly, after two months of silence, eight rockets were fired from the Gaza Strip stopped the Purim celebration in Ashdod, an Israeli city, for a few minutes yesterday. The alert came as the movie theaters and streets were filled with people. Later, alarms were also heard in Ashkelon and elsewhere. It took the IDF a few hours to locate and eliminate the sources of the rocket fire, which was coming from the middle of the tenth city of Gazan refugees. Despite the rocket squads attempting to use these refugees as human shields, the IDF eliminated them without harm to anyone else. Please, this is the time to make sure that the truth reaches far. Share our videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and support us. Only through this YouTube channel or through our official website, which is shown below. Switching our focus to the Northern Front, it is known to all Lebanese residents that the government is not in the hands of the elected officials, but in the hands of Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of the terrorist organization Hezbollah. Nasrallah is not interested in a war with Israel, but was dragged into the conflict unwillingly and is now looking for a way back out without losing face. Nasrallah's image as a strong and calculated man has cracked in Lebanon. Its promise to end the fighting in Gaza has not been kept. Now the population of Lebanon is suffering badly from the situation and from the fighting. Many Shiite villages remain empty of their inhabitants. The residents of southern Lebanon have evacuated further north and they are forced to look for an alternative place to reside and for schools, monasteries and wherever there is a vacancy. These people are suffering a lot, while most of them are not at all interested in a war with Israel. If there is a big war with Israel, it will be the last one, as it will lead to the collapse of Hezbollah. Many journalists in Lebanon say that Nasrallah is taking Lebanon into a war that cannot withstand, and that the government and the Lebanese army do not have the strength to deal with it. We will continue to report on every development in Israel and the activities of the IDF to protect the people of Israel and drive away the Iranian-inspired evil that threatens us. But the threat is not only Hezbollah rockets that could be fired into Israel from Lebanon. The Shin Bet and the IDF had conducted operations in recent months to capture a large number of illegal immigrants and large amounts of weapons which were smuggled over the border with Lebanon. Most of the people and weapons Iran has smuggled into Israel end up in the Arab-Israeli villages, turning them into the Wild West. Surely the terrorist organizations are watching this and see the potential of using this situation in their own plans. This includes raising money by working with narcotics, traffickers, and organized criminal syndicates to smuggle drugs, weapons, and people into Israel from Lebanon. There are many aspects of these situations which are not allowed to be published at this time. But what I can tell you is that the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps in Iran are directly involved in the situation. It is well known that the IRGC and Hezbollah have connections with narcotics traffickers in Latin America and they have also been involved in terror organizations targeting Israelis in many countries around the world. A year ago, Iran's supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, issued a directive to increase these efforts and also to step up efforts to attack Israelis inside Israel itself. This is partially a response to attacks against Iranian nuclear scientists, regime officials, nuclear research sites, and military bases inside Iran over recent years. The regime believes that Israeli intelligence are involved in intense attacks and they would like to respond by doing to us what they think we're doing to them. It is enough to see a short list of some of the captured contraband to understand the magnitude of the problem. They include anti-tank missiles, 
plastic explosives, rocket propelled grenades, rifles, pistols, and heavy machine guns, and even light artillery cannons. This, of course, is just what was intercepted. Much more go through, and there is fear that Russian made anti aircraft weapons are also being smuggled inside. Attacks against Israelis in Judea and Samaria are also growing concerns, as the Iranians are also believed to be trying to make contact with criminal networks inside Judea and Samaria. The rising tide of evil that Iran is a central part of is threatening the entire civilized world, not just Israel. Important to remember that Europe, Russia, America, Latin America, India, and even China is facing a problem that will require great courage to overcome. Israel has been bravely standing against this threat for 3,000 years, and that's not going to change now. Please do not forget to continue praying for the peace of Jerusalem and the peace of Israel. We serve an awesome God. He's our protector. We have faith in Him, and we will win this war because of Him. Amen. Hello, this is Mati here in Jerusalem with TBN Israel. This is Yair Pinto from TBN Israel here in Jerusalem. TBN Israel is keeping viewers informed with Israel-focused news, culture, and what God is doing in this land. Support TBN Israel today online at tbn.org Israel. Thank you.